We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yeah, there's joy. Come on. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Yeah. And we won't be quiet. We shout out of your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Come on. Gonna shout out of your praise. We shout out of your praise. Come on, sing. We sing to the God who heals. Come on, church. Sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. church let's wake up and praise the lord can we make some noise for jesus this morning give him a shout of praise in this church house come on we're gonna sing this together and i want every voice we're gonna sing we were the beggars now we're royalty amen church we were the prisoners but now we're running free and my favorite we are forgiven in christ accepted and redeemed by his sufficient grace let the house of the Lord sing praise. Can we sing this together, y'all? Come on, let's sing it one time. Here we go. We were the beggars, hey. Now we're royal. We were the prisoners, come on. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Let's sing that again. We're the beggars. We are the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. The prisoners. Now we're we are forgiven. Come on. We are forgiven. Accepted. Redeemed by his grace. Let the
Lord, let your kingdom, Father, let your kingdom come. Come on. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Come on. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us, as we forgive the ones who sinned against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. to have a family this size I just pray you'll continue to be with us watch over us let the love show through this is our family forever now be with the offering watch it bless us and be with us in all things in Jesus name amen we are going to continue to worship but please feel free to be seated So as we get into this next song, church, we're wanting to try something new, and that is um, worship that doesn't cease. A bunch of us have had people come up to us and, and say, we, we don't want to stop worshiping, and amen, praise the Lord. What a great thing to have people in your church say that they don't want to stop worshiping the Lord. Amen, church. Amen. So even in this time of offering, I hope we can all together see that who else would we give offering to but the Lord God Almighty. Our offering to him is part of our worship. Amen, church? Amen. Who else would you give an offering to? Father, our God, 
is mighty and he, he alone is worthy. So let's think about that as we get into this next time of worship.
do together as one. The prayer of our Lord Jesus before he went to the cross was that we would be one, like he and the Father are one. And so we come to the table together uh, to take the wine and the bread together. Um, it's a really important time for the church, but it's a really a time of thanksgiving and joy, right? If you're in Christ, God's will for you, for me, is to be joyful, prayerful, thankful. And that word thankful literally means to recognize and acknowledge his grace in our life. And so that's what we do when we come to the table together. Uh, our small group was talking about the passage that uh, Pastor Justin will be preaching on today, Hebrews 8, and just really amazed at this better covenant that Jesus is the mediator of. And, and we went all over the place, but we sort of landed it near the end on this, this passage from Titus. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. That's who we used to be before Christ. But Christ makes all the difference. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's one of the themes of Hebrews. We have a better hope. We're a people of better hope because we have a better home awaiting and we have a better great high priest with a better covenant. And so as the Apostle Paul instructed the church as we come together today, he instructs the church to come sensitive, thinking about, thoughtful about this new covenant and about what our Lord Jesus has already done. And so he says to the church, examine yourself. So let's take a moment before we take of the bread and the wine and just reflect and examine yourself and how joyful and prayerful and thankful you are and will be in the new year thinking about what Jesus has already done. And together, thankful, remembering what the Lord Jesus has already done, we remember the words from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, thank you, and we do this in remembrance of you, acknowledging, celebrating your grace in our life and in the life of your church. Amen. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant the better covenant, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we do remember what you have already done, what you did on the cross and the power of the resurrection and your ascension to the throne room where you intercede for us even now. 
Lord, we give thanks. We praise you and thank you for what you have already done has made us brothers and sisters, one. And so we do this in remembrance of you, in your name. Amen. you've done. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to move in us and through us, your church, Father, that we would hear from you, that we would hear exactly and precisely what you would need us to hear today. We ask that you would be with our pastor, that you would guide his, his voice today, that we would hear from you and that you would give us ears to listen, open the eyes of our hearts, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, grab your Bibles. Grab your Bibles. And find Hebrews 
chapter 8. Find Hebrews chapter 8 for me. And you'll be in verse 1. So Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. We're kind of branching into a new subject today, and, and we'll get there uh, as, we, as we work through the text. Have you ever noticed that um, someone sitting can say a lot? Like where they sit or when they sit, like the action of sitting can speak. Um, you know, if somebody's uh, being lazy, if you saw somebody that's supposed to be working, but instead of working, you see them reclining in a chair. Does that not speak volumes? Um, and this could go on. I could give you lots of examples, but I'll give you one. One time I had this young man. He was about 15 years old, and uh, he had done something wrong in church. Church was real small at the time. We used to meet in a warehouse, and um, I told the young man that I needed to talk with him that week when he came to church. I said, when you get to church on Wednesday, I need you to meet me in my office. Now, I'm not one to like hold sacred my office as if my office is something special. It's just a room. I just need somewhere that sometimes I could get away or whatever. So it doesn't have to be big or nice. In this particular office, there was a, a window that was like a one-way mirror because it used to be a cry room uh, for the church that was there before and we had turned it into my office. So it wasn't like I was trying to be a weirdo with like a one-way mirror in my office. It was there when I got there. I just had it. And, but I say that because you could see into the sanctuary from that office. You could look out into the sanctuary area that we had. And so uh, this young man got to church. I was in the sanctuary and saw through the door and he went in and went into my office. I finished up what I was doing. He obviously could have seen me through the one-way glass. He could have seen that I was there, that I was out working, and he definitely could have seen that I was making my way to the office. And when I got to the office, there he was in my chair like behind the desk. And I told you, like, I'm not, I'm not too picky. Like, I tried to, like, laugh it off. I was like, hey, man, come on, out of my chair. Let me have that. And he doubled down on me. Now, are you hearing what I'm saying? Like, where you sit and when you sit can speak volumes. This young man doubled down on me. And he went, no, I'm going to sit here. You sit on that side. I promise you, I looked at that young man, and I meant this. I said, you move or I move you out of my seat. Why would I be so forthright to say, you're not going to sit behind the desk, I'm going to sit back there? What was he demonstrating if I let him sit back there? Power, authority, he was the one in control. How about just defiance and disobedience because he was 15 years old and being rude? Like, no, you're not going to sit in my chair. Get out of my chair. That's my chair. I'm going to sit there because you're the one being corrected right now, not me. You're not going to dictate the situation. You see what I'm saying? Like where you sit and when you sit, that speaks volumes. Today, I'm going to show you something. I hope that you got this. I hope you're going to read it with me. Now, remember what I just said about where we sit, right? It's it, when and where we sit. That can speak a whole lot. I need you to read this text with me. You've got to read along with me. I need you to slow down, slow your brain. There's a thousand things going for all of us, but read this real intently with me. Will you read this with some intent? Can you do that? Yes. Do you have Hebrews 8 and 1? Yes. Here we go. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. Just pause. Just, no, just, you just keep your eyes right there on your paper, but pause. Look at that again. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, he said, see that you make it all, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. Inasmuch as he is also mediator 
of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Oh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I don't know if I am, well, no, I do know I'm not fit to speak on such weighty things. Oh God, I pray that you would pour your spirit out upon us, pour your spirit out upon me that I might speak for you, pour your spirit out upon us that we might all hear from you. Father, that we would grasp the the gravity of the moment as we have read such a holy thing. Father, I ask that you would move in this place in a mighty way, and I pray for those who do not know you as their Savior, that even right now you would begin to work on them and draw them unto yourself. Father, for those who have been far from you but made their way into church on a cold January morning, wondering why they're even here, Father, I pray that you would manifest yourself to them and that you would be seen in all your majesty and all your glory. And we trust you at your word that if your son Jesus is lifted up, that he will draw all men unto himself. So Father, for nothing else, we beg you that your son's name would be lifted high above every other name this morning. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, verse one. Now this is the main point. Could I overstate that? Did I make that, did I tell you, did I come up here today and go, this is the main thing that Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews wants to tell you. Am I saying that? The writer of Hebrews who's been writing all, do you understand where we've come from? Does anybody remember? Do you remember go way back as we started Hebrews and we started off by talking about Jesus compared with the angels? Do you remember that? And we talked about Jesus compared with the prophets. Even the opening of Hebrews started with God who in diverse manners and at diverse times spoke in times past through the prophets, but has in these later days spoken to us through his son Christ Jesus. So he has spoken to us through the prophets in the past, but now we have Jesus. So we have Jesus compared to the prophets. We had Jesus compared to the angels. Then in the last few weeks, in the last few chapters, what have we seen? Jesus in comparison to the priest. Am I, telling, am I telling the truth? Have you been sticking with me? Are you with me on that? Like Jesus compared to the priest. And we kind of honed in on this one priest, this particular guy, his name was Melchizedek. Remember that guy? And we focused on Melchizedek. We now branch from Melchizedek, from the priesthood, we now branch into a new subject. You see it twice inside of this. As the writer says, inside of what we just read, we, the writer said, this is the main point of the things we are saying. Now, I'm going to get to this in a moment. I'm going to get through what he says, but I want you to just scroll down to verse 2 and see that he's a minister of the sanctuary and of the true, would you please say this word with me, of the true tabernacle. Scroll on down with your eyes and get down to verse 5 and look in verse 5. Who serve the copy and a shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the, please say it, tabernacle. We're moving to a new subject. There's a new comparison that's about to happen as we've talked about Jesus compared to the angels, Jesus compared to the prophets, Jesus compared to the priest. We are now going to see Jesus in this thing called the tabernacle. And this crazy thing that happens, this is the main point of the things that we see. Are you ready to see the main point of all the things the writer could say is the main point? We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Here is the main point as we branch from from the priest to this new subject, the tabernacle. We're given the main point of the whole book of Hebrews. That our priest, have we learned about a priest? Have you learned about a priest in here? If God wants to speak to man, he goes through a prophet. But if man needs to get to God, he goes through the priest. You with me? Now, we have such a high priest. This is the main point. Here is our high priest. Are you ready? Here's the main point. He's been seated. Now, I could go on all day about what this could mean. The implications are far and wide, but do you understand what it means for somebody who has been seated? We used to have this thing in my house. 
I would work all day and I would come home, I would work at the fabric store, I'd be doing upholstery work, and certainly there were times in doing upholstery work where I would sit down and I would put something on a table in front of me and I would be working with my hands. I would come home at night and, and I would sit in a chair sometimes and I would work on my computer. I would write sermons or I would do my schoolwork when I was still in seminary, but I would be working as I was sitting in the chair. But I would go upstairs at the end of the night and we had these two chairs in my bedroom. They're still there. They were both mine and Sarah's chairs. They were our special little spot that we had in our bedroom that we would sit and talk with each other every night. She had this habit that she would, do y'all ever do this? Your wives or husbands ever do this to you? They start talking before they enter the room. There's just like an assumption you'll be listening. You ever do that? Like she'd be like in the hallway and she'd be like, oh honey, by the way, the outlet. And she'd be like, do you want to tell me about something that's like broken or what? She'd be like, by the way, the outlet's not working. And she'd walk through the door and she'd see me in that chair. After I've worked all day, now I might sit when I was working. After I'd been on my computer, I might sit while I was on my computer. But when she would come in the room and she would see me sitting in that chair, you know what she would say? Oh, I didn't realize you were sitting down. I'm I'm sorry. Because what was I indicating after I'd worked on furniture all day and worked on sermons all night and it was finally 10 o'clock at night and I was sitting in our chairs in our bedroom? What was I indicating? I was done. My work for that day was completed. Do you understand that for Jesus to sit at the right hand of the Father, he is making a statement. His work is done. Look at it with me. I need you to look into into the Gospel of John and look at chapter 20. Look at John chapter 20. I'm sorry, chapter 19. I said the wrong reference. I knew I was going to do that. John chapter 19 and verse 30. John chapter 19 and verse 30. That's why we write things down, Justin. Uh, John, I like try never to look at my notes, but when it's references, I have to sometimes. John chapter 19 and then verse 30. So you're in Hebrews. Just go back towards the... So like you're going towards the beginning of the Bible, but don't go super far. You're in the New Testament. You're going to find John. If you see Matthew, Mark, or Luke, you're too far. John, chapter 19, verse 30. Do you have it? Now, this is as Christ is hanging on the cross. And do you know what his last words are on the cross? In verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, would you please say this with me? It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. The last words that Jesus says when hanging on the cross to pay for our sins is what? It is finished. And he died on the cross and they put him in a tomb. And three days later, our beloved Lord rose from the grave. And 40 days after that, he ascended to the Father. And when he ascended to the Father... He sat down. Why did Christ sit? Because it's done. It's finished. Do you understand the gravity of saying that it is done? Let me give you an earthly example to show you the gravity of how much it should be, how the weight of what that should mean to state that Christ is done and to have a seat by the Father. We have a band right now, our church band. Y'all, you, you just don't even know. I, I know that music is one of those things that everybody has an opinion. Did you know that? Do you know everybody has an opinion about music? I know, I know many of your opinions too. <laughs> and so I, I just wish we could all latch on to the fact that nobody is ever going to like every song. It's just never gonna be there. And uh, nobody's ever going to fully agree. But we have a really great band. And the reason I can say that is because I've watched the band progress from one lady, Sherry, singing on the piano with a hymnal because that's what we had. And to grow to having singers and musicians and good singers and good musicians and good music. We are blessed with really good music. And oftentimes we think like, okay, what's next? Like, what's the next thing we're going to do? Well, I've been telling our brother Kirk for a while, I've been telling him, I've been saying, look, I think the next thing that happens for our worship band, I think the next thing that happens is that we write our own songs. Jameson says this really cool line all the time. He always pops off with this. He, he points out that I don't use other people's sermons, right? 
That's what I'll say. Like the Lord says, sing unto him a new song. He's like, we don't, we, I don't read other people's sermons to you. I write my own sermons. And so we have this thing. We really feel like the Lord is calling us to write music and to produce our own music because it's a new song that we should sing unto him. And our worship band should have a, a message for us as well. Just as much as I'm preaching a message, I'm giving you the behind the scenes to tell you that we've been working at, our band is now working at writing our own songs for the sole reason of letting the Holy Spirit speak to us. We still love other people's songs. We still love other people's sermons. I'm just telling you we're working on our own music. And so we've been doing this. We're working on our own music. I was talking to Kirk the other day and I told him, I said, I just want you to imagine the day that you hop on Spotify and you pull up Salt and Light Worship on Spotify because we have a whole album. Now, I just want you to imagine with me if Kirk stands up here and Sherry's up here with him and they say, we have an announcement. We have a full album of songs that we've made. Just stick with the illustration for a minute. They say, we've got a full album of songs that we've created. It's gonna be done in a couple of weeks. Don't you think we're all gonna clap and cheer? I know I'll be, I mean, I'll be, I'll be all for it. I'll, I'm gonna be cheering, hands raised. It's gonna be great. I'll listen to it all the time. I love our band. I'll be so excited for that. Imagine they say, we're gonna have it. It's gonna be on Spotify. Justin will get his dream. He'll be able to click on Spotify and listen to Salt and Light Worship, our own songs that we wrote. And then they stand up here a few weeks later and they go, guys, it is finished. The album is done. Or we all gonna cheer. Now I want you to imagine on a Sunday morning, I want you to imagine that I'm sitting on that computer right there where Danny's sitting. I got headphones on and Kirk walks in the door and he says, what are you doing? And I pull the headphones back and I go, oh, I'm just working on the mix for your all's album. Would that be insulting? If Kirk just said it's done the week prior and then I'm over here on the computer messing with the mix, would you think that that's rude? How dare anyone think we need to add anything to Christ who said it is finished. His work on the cross is done and nothing else needs to be done. Do you understand when he died for you, he died for you completely. You don't need to earn your salvation. You don't have to buy your salvation. There's no special prayer. There is nothing that you can do. There is not a word that you can say, a scripture that you can read that that's it. If I'll read this thing, now I'm saved. No, my friend, Jesus died on the cross for you. He went in the tomb. He rose from the tomb and sat down beside the right hand of the Father and you are saved by his spilt blood and only that. And anything that you add to it is an insult to his name. It's an insult to his work. It is finished. It is finished. It's done. He has sat down by the right hand of the Father. There's no more work that you could do and anything else would be a novice messing with the mix. What could you offer him that would be better than his own blood? Do you, think, do you think that you can apologize enough to those you've done wrong to to match his blood that was shed for you? Could you do enough good deeds? Could you give enough? Could we pass the plate around and maybe you could give some more? Could you empty your entire bank account into the church's funds, into the church's offering? Would that be enough to pay for all that you've done? What does that look like? I ask you this question. What's your whole bank account look like in comparison to the life of Jesus that he gave for you? Do you see? It is finished. It's done. And not only that he set, but also I need you to see where he is sitting. Look at this with me. We have such a high priest. I'm in Hebrews chapter 8, and I'm still in verse, well, I'm, I'm still in verse 1. We have such a high priest who is seated and look where he's seated, at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. If you look at verse three with me, it starts to make even a little more sense. For every high priest is appointed. I'm in verse three. You with me in verse three? Yep. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. Did you understand what he just said? On earth, in the Old Testament... The priests were to offer sacrifices and they were to offer gifts. Now we're moving into a segment in the book of Hebrews. We're moving into a segment where we're going to talk about the tabernacle. Could I please get the picture up for the tabernacle? I want to give you all a visual of what the tabernacle was. That's the tabernacle. That's a, a man-made recreation of the tabernacle because I don't think the tabernacle had a generator or 
electric, whatever that is in the bottom left. Uh, so however they're lighting that or whatever probably wasn't period specific. But the rest of it, they're trying their best. You get a good visual of what the tabernacle was. That, that's funny, y'all, about the electric thing. I don't know if they knew that was in the picture. They probably should have hit it. A little. I mean, it looks like a desert. I feel like there's probably more room they could have put it somewhere, but whatever. Who am I? That's the, that's the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the tent. The big part here is the tabernacle proper. It's got a fence that goes around it, and then it's got the brazen altar and the la what they would call the laver. That's the, the basin where they would wash. So you have to understand the picture that if you wanted to get to God, what's the priest do? The priest takes people to God. If you needed to get to God, you wanted to make an offering or you needed to make a sacrifice. An offering saying, something good's happened in my life. I want to bless the name of the Lord. I'm going to bring an offering to the Lord. A sacrifice would be if I had done wrong or if you had done wrong. I've sinned and I need to repent. Well, for me to repent, I'm going to take a sacrifice to the Lord. How would you or I take a sacrifice to the Lord? Well, if we were way back then we would go to the tabernacle. We would enter, there's, it's not in the picture, I wish it was, but there's only one door and it's kind of over here. You'd have to go to the door of the tabernacle and the priest would take your offering. You would bring an animal with you, sometimes a bird or sometimes a, an ox or sometimes it would be a, a lamb. You'd bring it to the door of the tabernacle and then the priest would meet you there and slaughter the animal there. And the blood would be presented to the Lord and the, the fat of the animal would be burned on that altar and they would burn the fat of the animal and then the priest could take that offering a little further. They could take it into the first room. That, that big part of the tabernacle is divided into two rooms and they could go in that, in that room of the tabernacle. If you wanted to get to God, the way you would get there is to go to that building, that tent, through that one door. You couldn't go all the way in. The only person who could go all the way in was the priest. Now, are you sticking with me? What have we been learning? Here's the main point of what we've been learning. Who is our great high priest? Jesus Christ. Who has been seated. Where has he been seated? At the right hand of the majesty on high. What is he doing there? Why would he be seated there? Is he, is he being lazy? Is he going to prop his feet up? Okay, I've done the work and it's over. Nothing left. Well, there's no more cross. There's no more sacrifice that needs to be made. But what is he doing while he's there? Read it with me again in verse three. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Remember what I just told you. If you needed to get to God, you go there. Well, my picture's gone, but you get the idea. You go to the tabernacle, you go to the door of the tent, and the priest would take your offering in. So here we have it. That's what the priest would do. They would offer gifts and sacrifices, offerings and sacrifices. Now read it. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. Wait a minute. What is he offering? If he's seated, what is he offering? Friends, he's seated. The work is done. Jesus doesn't have to go up and go sacrifice a little lamb and take the lamb's blood to the, back to the Lord and go in and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. The Lord. Jesus doesn't have to do that. Why? Because he was the lamb. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. I'll back you up just a few verses into chapter 7. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. Sorry, guys, I don't think I wrote this one for you, but it's just come to me on the fly. So just pull it up for me when I, when I ask you for it, okay? Pull up Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Look back at all you on the, if you've got your Bibles in front of you, just look back a little bit on your page. Hebrews 7 and verse 25. Therefore, he is also able to save, remember this, to the uttermost. I love that line, from the guttermost to the uttermost, right? And no, it's not about a cow, for those of you who tried to say it that way. He was to the uttermost. Therefore, he'd save you to the uttermost, those who come to God through him. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. How did they used to get to God? Where would they go? The, the priest through the tabernacle. Look at this. He's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Read it. Since he, is always, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Not only is he seated at the right hand of the Father, but he ever lives to make intercession for you. You see, when I sin and I need to repent, I go to Jesus and I say, Jesus, I am sorry, I have sinned. And guess who is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for me? You see, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, and it is the man Christ Jesus who is sitting at the right hand of the Father, even right now, to make intercession for you and I. 
If I want to make an offering to the Lord, how do I, how do, I do that? Do I go to a tent? Is it this building? Is it this place? Is this it? Is this where I go? I go through Christ. If I want to get to the Lord, how do I get there? My great high priest, Christ, who makes intercession for us. He is ever there to make intercession for us. I have to sometimes try to use illustrations, and it's hard with such grand things to think that Christ is ever present with the Father, making intercession for us. How can I relate that? So I have to use like cheap earthly examples. So you'll have to forgive that some of this example probably will not match up completely, but you, I think you'll get the point. We used to do work for the local hospital in LaGrange. Maybe it's that way. Uh, in LaGrange, there was a local hospital. It used to be, before it was changed over to Baptist, it used to be Tri-County. Anybody remember when it was Tri-County Hospital? Well, we, as a, when I was working at the fabric store, we at, at our company, we got a contract with the hospital. And so anytime the hospital had work that they needed to do, we would be the ones to do it. So an exam table gets ripped or a chair gets ripped in the waiting room or whatever. We were the guys to go and fix it. We would go in and go do it. And sometimes they would have whole things like they want to remodel and make it look different. They would call us and give us a hundred chairs all at once. We love that kind of work. That's repetitive work all the time. You get it over and over and over. So we have this grand idea. Hey, we want more of that type of work. There was a guy that we knew there, his name was Joey. The only way we ever got in with that hospital was because Joey would call us and say, hey, there's a recliner that got ripped in one of the rooms or whatever, go, go and get it. And it's back on the loading dock or we need you to go into this waiting room and get all these chairs. Joey would be our contact. Well, we got the bright idea. We tried to contact every, we thought, okay, let's get the bigger hospitals. Let's look at Norton and Baptist and Jewish and let's try to get some of the bigger hospitals in Louisville. And so we did, we tried to get those hospitals and got stonewalled for years. Couldn't get in. It's really hard to get a hospital to trust you. They're, they got plenty of money to burn. They'll throw those things away and just buy new ones. Hard to get them to think that they could have somebody fix the old one instead of buy a new one. So it's really hard to get in. Well, one day we get a call. Before this was Baptist, we get a call from Baptist in Louisville. They want us to come up and give them a quote. Hey, this is great. We got a call from Baptist. You know why we got a call from Baptist? Because Joey left Tri-County and went over to Baptist. And so Joey said, hey, don't throw that out. I know somebody that can fix it. And Joey put our name in. And the way we got in with Baptist was because Joey was over there. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? Why can you get in with the Father? What would make it available that you could get to the Father? You have an advocate who is seated right beside him. Do you get it? It's not only the fact that, he's, that Jesus is at, he's not beside the Father with the spear like he's ready to do some work. The work has been done. He's seated beside the Father. And he's there to make intercession for you. And I got one more for you. It's who he's seated beside. Read this with me. Oh, this is good. I don't care what time it is. I'm not gonna look because I, I want you to see this in its whole, in its entirety. Look at what happens next. You see, and I'm gonna read that first part again. We have such a high priest. This is the main point, y'all. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Who is he seated beside? Almighty God. Almighty God. Could you say God with me? Who's he seated beside? God. God. I'm gonna say, you're gonna say the Father this time. Who's he seated beside? The Father, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, at the right hand of the majesty. Now, I need you to read the rest of the passage. Jump down into verse four with me. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. So in other words, he, Jesus would not be here sacrificing animals. That's according to the law. That's what they used to do. Jesus has a new ministry. He has died for your sins and he's the one seated at the right hand of the Father. And read this with me. Who serve as a copy, I'm in verse five, who serve as a copy and a shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed, could you say that? I wanna make sure you're not asleep today. I'm enjoying making y'all say stuff. Can you say divinely instructed? Divine. Divinely instructed. Moses was divine. Who gave him these instructions? Moses sat down and drew a picture of a tent? No, God gave him, divinely instructed him. Look at how he says it. Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make, would you say that? The tabernacle. That tabernacle, the picture I just showed you, there's something that we all recognize. In the Old Testament, Israelites, they would get to God at the place of the tabernacle. Could you pull up the, the other picture? No, the other one for me. This is the, an overhead view of the tabernacle. The door is over here. You would come in through the door and there's the altar of burnt offerings. That's the brazen altar. And then you get to the laver. They would wash their hands there to wash the blood off their hands. They would wash at the laver. 
And then they would go into the tabernacle. Now, the only person who could go in, the only people who go in the tabernacle, the holy place, where there were three articles, there was three articles of furniture there. There was the golden lampstand, the altar of incense, literally incense that smell good. They would burn them and light them, incense. And then there was the table of showbread. There were two stacks of six loaves of bread in each stack, 12 loaves of bread, and they were on this table. Do you notice? Now, imagine with me, you are a priest. Your job is to take the sacrifices, sacrifice the animal, burn the animal, wash, go into the holy place. They would have the bread in the holy place. Sometimes they would eat the meat in the holy place. Do you notice something that is missing from the holy place? There's no chairs. The priest would go into the holy place, but there was no chairs in the holy place. Beyond the holy place is the most holy. It's divided into two segments, and in the most holy place... There's something there that's very special. Nobody can touch this item that is in the holy place. In the Old Testament, nobody could touch it. At one point, they put it on a cart, and it went to fall off, and this guy reached up to catch it, and when he touched it, he died. Nobody's even allowed to touch it. They could not even look at it. When they would move in the wilderness, they would let the tent down over top of, the te over top of this article, which is called the Ark of the Covenant. Now stick with me, this is about to get really heavy. You're gonna have to pay attention. If you're not paying attention, you're gonna miss this. Notice in the holy place, what is missing? A chair. The most holy place, only one guy gets to go in once a year. Not all the priests. You see, everybody could go to where it says E. That doesn't mean everybody, it means east. But, but still, everybody could go to the E. Everybody could go to, to east, but they couldn't go any further. The priest could go to the altar of burnt offerings and to the brazen laver in the courtyard, and they could go into the holy place. All the priests could. That's a whole bunch of guys. But only one guy, once a year, can go all the way into the most holy place. He could do it on the Day of Atonement, and he would have to go in first and make an offering for himself. They would go into the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was once a year, one day a year. Does everybody get that? Now stick with me at this Ark of the Covenant. I'm telling you, Hebrews is doing it for us. There's a, a bridge that's happening into the tabernacle. We'll read more about it in chapter 9. I'll discuss more of it, but would you read it with me? I want to show you something really, really cool. Hebrews chapter 9, and look at verse 2. Pick up in verse 2 with me. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 2. Now, remember, what did I say to you? Wait, where'd my picture go? Put my picture back up. All right, now, now look, you go into the holy place. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk to y'all that way. I love you guys. All right, look, you go into the holy place. There's no chairs there, right? Please stick with me as I read through this. You can pull up the text now. I know that's what you were doing. Look, look at this text with me. Hebrews chapter nine, verse two. For a tabernacle was prepared the first part in which was the lampstand and the table of showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Does everybody have a picture of the holiest of all right now? You got it? The holiest of all. Verse 3. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which there was a golden pot that had the manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tablets of the covenant. That's the Ten Commandments. They're all inside of the ark of the covenant. Are you getting a picture? There's a, an ark, a chest. Inside of the chest, there's Aaron's rod that budded. There's the tablets. There's some manna that's been sitting there in the ark all this time. Now in verse 5, read this with me and start, see if you don't start to see a correlation. And above it were the cherubims of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Oh, there is a seat in the tabernacle. It's only one seat. Do you know where it is? Do you know why? I need my picture, y'all. That'd be on these things. You know why you couldn't go into the most holy place? Why couldn't the, the priest, the regular priest, why couldn't the average Joe go into the most holy place? Why couldn't Moses see God when God was passing by? Why couldn't he see all of God? It would kill him. The average guy can't go into the most holy place because that's where God was residing. He had put his presence there. That was seen in this gl glorious smoke that was all day, this cloud that was all day. And at night, it was, a, it was a pillar of fire over top of this place, the tabernacle, all night long. And in that most holy place where God was, there is one seat. And who can go to that seat? Only the high priest. Now stick with me. Who is Jesus seated beside God the Father. And what's the one seat that's in the most holy place? 
Please say it. The mercy seat. It's not the rest seat. It's not the relaxation seat. It's the mercy seat. If you translate it from Hebrew, I can't do it. I can't say it right. But if you translate it from Hebrew, it literally means the place of propitiation. Anybody remember when I taught you about propitiation, that big word? Remember what that meant? Atone means to cover sin, but propitiation means to take it away. What is in the most holy place? The mercy seat, the place of propitiation. Do you know what they would put on the mercy seat when they would go in? The blood of the sacrifices. The one priest once a year would go in and he would take the blood from the sacrifice and you know where he would sprinkle it? On the mercy seat. Who is seated on the mercy seat? The one who shed his blood for you. The one who advocates for you and looks at the Father and puts his hands out with the imprint still there and says, Father, those are mine. And when I go to the Father and say, Father, will you forgive me? The Father doesn't just see me. First, he sees his Son seated at his right hand whose finished work has already paid for me. Friends, let this sink in for a moment. The one thing that was with God, with the Ark of the Covenant, was a seat of mercy. Let the visual, I wish I had all day to preach this. Let the visual picture of this sit in. What's under the mercy seat? It's the law. What tops off the law? Mercy. The same God who said in Deuteronomy, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Why does God top off the, the covenant? Why does he top it off with mercy? Because friends, that's the goal the whole time. Do you remember when Jesus came? Do you remember what he said? He said, I didn't come to condemn the world because the world's condemned already. He said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. What does God the Father in his holiest throne room surrounded by a glass crystal sea and rainbows and angels that cry, holy, holy, holy all day long. What does that God want? Does he want to strike you down? Does he hate you because you're a sinner? He, thank you, Becky. Somebody else say no with Becky. What does he want for you? To show you mercy. And how do you, how do you have that mercy? Those who come to him through his son, Jesus. Friends, I think that's a perfect place to end. I had another story, but I think it's even better to just stay right there. I'm gonna ask you this question. Have you come to the mercy seat? You know, the priest, I hope my picture, I'm going to turn around, my picture better be there. No. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, look, it's there. Okay, look. How did the priest get into the holy place? There was a big veil that stayed in between them. Do you know what happened when Christ died? The veil was torn. You know what the Bible says about that veil being torn? It wasn't torn from the bottom to the top. It specifies that the veil was torn from the top to the bottom, like top down. Almost like God the Father reached down and opened up the veil himself and he split it open wide and he didn't just open it at its seam. He didn't just open it and pull it back. He ripped it from the top to the bottom to say it will never be repaired. You can go. The high priest could go in the Old Testament into the, holy, into the most holy place, but now you can go right into the most holy place. How? Because the advocate is seated on the mercy seat waiting to show you the mercy of the Father. Would you come today? I'm asking this question up on your feet, everybody. Would you come to the mercy seat today? God is waiting for you. He wants to show you mercy. Hebrews chapter four and verse four, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are and yet without sin. Read this, let us us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain, would you say it please? Mercy and find grace in time of need. Do you need the Lord today? Come to his mercy seat. Do you need deliverance today? Come to his mercy seat. Do you need forgiveness? Come to his mercy seat. Would you make a decision to come to the Lord today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we love you above all things. Lord, I said it when I started and I feel even worse now. How can I speak of such holy and high things? Only to think that you have torn the veil for me and invited me in. 
that as much as my brain tells me to enter with fear and trepidation, you tell me that I can come boldly. So here I am, unworthy and dirty. I don't deserve to be here, but Lord, you allow me to speak with you and I say thank you for it. God, would you move in this place in a mighty way? But I don't, I don't know if everybody can see it the way I see it, but Father, I, I pray that you would speak to us, that we might see that you have sat down on the mercy seat. It's done. Father, I know right now, I know they're here. I know they're in our building right now, still trying to work their way to you. Father, would we see that it is done? It's finished. Father, I know there's some right here right now that don't think they can come to you. Father, would you remind us again that it is done, it is finished, and our advocate is sitting right beside you who lives to make intercession for us. Bless your holy name, Father. I can say no more. Take this time, do with it whatever you want. In Jesus' name, amen.
I just want to reflect as a community here on, on the truth of it is finished. Um, we talk a lot about next steps at this church, of, of always having a next step to Jesus and closer to Jesus um, in light of his finished work. We're not... We're not taking steps closer as if we were farther away and now we're, now we're more secure or he loves us more. Um, we're taking steps deeper in relationship with him. It's not about how he views us, but of how we view our relationship with him. And so I want to encourage us as a church body to always be looking of how, how can I take my relationship with Christ deeper um, and so I don't know what that step is for you. Um, if it's 
uh, salvation, if it's knowing who Jesus is, if it's baptism. We have a next step room in the back. If you turn down this hallway to the right, we've got deacons uh, and people there to pray with you after service. They're going to stick around. Um, if you are a woman in the church, next Sunday at one o'clock, right after service, we've got a cookie exchange going on. Um, you are welcome to come, uh, even if you don't bring cookies, but if you want to, bring a couple dozen and be prepared to bring some home. And then for our married couples in the church, um, next week is also the deadline for grace marriage. Um, all that information is on the website. Um, men, you should have got a flyer if you came in. Information for that's also on the website. Um, let me close us in prayer if we want to lift our hands. Um, Lord Jesus, you are um, amazing and seated on the throne. Uh, your finished work in us, we are eternally grateful for. Um, we just want to rest in the truth that we are secure in your hands. Um, Lord, nothing that we could do could separate us. Nothing that the world could do could separate us. Lord, you have a tight, tight grip on us, and you promise to never let us go. Lord, let us have confidence in that, that when we leave this place, we are on fire for you to, to be the salt and the light to a world that is um, so dark these days. God, empower us with your gospel. It's in your son's amazing name we pray. Amen. Pick up after yourselves. Don't forget your children. We'll see you Wednesday at 7, 6 o'clock dinner. You're dismissed, church.